Hi guys, Shauna here. Today, I wanted to go ahead and share with you guys my labor and delivery story. This may be a long video, so if you are interested in this story, grab some popcorn, a drink, and get settled in and cozy, because I was in the hospital for quite a long time, so I'm assuming the story is gonna be a long one as well. Um, <clears throat> so, my labor and delivery story starts at my week 39 appointment. So on Monday, March 5th, I was, I had my week 39 appointment. It was the day I turned 39 weeks. I went into my appointment at around two o'clock and as with all my other appointments, we started the appointment off with an ultrasound. They did a biophysical profile as well as a growth check. Now, during the growth check, she was having a lot of trouble getting his measurements. Um, his knee was like jammed up into his stomach, which was making it hard to get the circumference of his stomach. And then also his head was really low, and so that was making it really hard to get his head circumference as well. Once she got all the measurements for his growth check, she did point out that he was measuring only about the 66th percentile which was a little worrisome because if you've been watching my previous updates, you'll know that he's always been in the 80th, per, eight, right around the 83rd percentile, somewhere between 80 and 85. So that was a little worrisome. She then also did the biophysical profile. He did his practice breaths, his amniotic fluid levels were good, heart rate was all good, but the whole time we were doing the ultrasound throughout the growth check and the biophysical profile, he hardly moved at all. Like, he didn't move at all. Nothing big enough for her to be able to count it as a movement which was worrisome. Um, I had also, I mentioned to my doctor at that point that he hadn't been moving much that day. Um, he had moved some, so I wasn't, I hadn't been too worried because I had felt him move. It just wasn't as much as he normally does. So at that point, they decided to hook me up to the non-stress um, test machine. And they also gave me a juice box to go ahead and see if we could get him moving some more. Um, when when they started the non-stress test, his heart rate was around 128 to 130, um, which is normal. It's in the normal range for like a resting heart rate. And then when they gave me the juice box for a couple minutes, it jumped up to 150-ish, but then it went right back down to a resting heart rate. So my doctor decided, she told me that his heart rate was good. It's nothing that she's too worried about. And if I was like 34, 35 weeks, she would probably just have me come back in a couple days and check him again. But since I was already 39 weeks and since everything wasn't looking perfect, it was a little worrisome between the growth check and his, um, him not just not moving around much. She decided on that day that she wanted to go ahead and induce me, which I was not thrilled with. I really wanted to go into labor naturally. I did not want to be induced, but his growth check really scared me. Um, just, I was hoping that it was just that she was having trouble getting the measurements, but the fact that he had basically not really grown at all in three weeks since I had had the last growth check kind of freaked me out a lot. <clears throat> um, and I think it freaked my doctor out too, and she just wasn't letting on. But so she just, she talked to me, she was like, you know, this isn't an emergency. I'm not rushing you over there right now. She's like, I want you to go home, take a shower, eat some dinner, finish packing the last minute things, and then come back to the hospital tonight and we'll go ahead and get it started. So I called my husband, who was still at work, I was like, so we're having a baby in the next couple of days. And he was like, wait, what? Um, anyway, so he met me at home and we did what, exactly what she said. I took a shower. We got our dog situated. My little brother, we got my little brother over there to take care of them. Um, we had dinner, um, all that stuff. And then we headed off to the hospital to get induced. That night when I got to the hospital, um, it was right around eight o'clock. And they went ahead and after they got like my IV hooked up and everything like that, they went ahead and gave me cervi cervi cervix, cervidel or cerv I don't know. It start It's to help loosen your, or to help ripen your cervix, um, to help soften it up. Oh, and I do want to point out at this appointment, 39 weeks, I had officially gained one pound this whole pregnancy. So my whole pregnancy, I only gained one pound. I just wanted to throw that out there. For those of you who had been watching along and were curious, I ended up gaining one pound the whole pregnancy. So anyways, we get to the hospital that night <clears throat> and they go ahead and they insert the cervi cervix stuff. Um, when I was at my appointment earlier in the day, she had checked my cervix and I was at a one. I was dilated to a one, but my cervix still wasn't very, like it was It was a little soft, but it just wasn't soft enough. Um, so she went ahead and gave me the cervix, cervi whatever, the cervix stuff. Um, when I got to the hospital that night, 
And that was painful. Apparently, I have a very high cervix, and it's like in a weird position. And they had a very hard time getting that. It's a little pill that they insert, and they had a really hard time getting it where it needed to go. And it was really painful, not going to lie. Probably one of the most painful parts of the whole pregnancy. <laughs> um, and so that sucked. So they gave me that. And as soon as they gave me that, within 20 minutes or so, I started having contractions pretty regularly. And they were starting to actually, like, be pretty painful. Um, and all night long, they gave me one more dose of that, like, four hours later. And then all night long, I had really, really consistent contractions, pretty much back to back. Um, they were going to give me a third dose four hours after the second dose. But because I was having contractions back to back, um, they decided, uh, I guess they can't give it to you if your contractions are more than three minutes, like, closer than three minutes apart. Um, and mine were, mine were literally back to back. So they couldn't give me any more of that. Um, so they just let me labor throughout the night. And then in the morning, um, they told me to eat and drink some stuff because they were going to go ahead and start the Pitocin. And once they started Pitocin, I was on a clear liquid diet only, which I was not thrilled with. So I did, I ordered breakfast and I ate that. And then I think around 9am, they went ahead and started the Pitocin. Once they started the Pitocin, I continued to have contractions back to back to back, um, never getting a break in between them, and they were painful. I did have back labor, and that was the worst part. I would go, most of my contractions I had back labor with, and then I could tell there was a few here and there where I didn't have any back labor, and I could handle those just fine. The back labor, though, was awful. Luckily, my husband was amazing and was, like, rubbing my back. Every time I'd have a contraction, I'd be like, oh, rub it, rub it, rub it. And he'd rub it, which, like I said, was almost consistently. But so that helped a lot. They kept, like, going up and down on the Pitocin because every time they went up, um, I was having the contractions so close to get, like, whenever they'd go back down on the contra on the Pitocin, I would have the contractions, like, two to three minutes apart. So it still felt back to back. But whenever they would up it, I would have contractions literally back to back, like, without any, like, with, a, like, a 30-second break in between. And they said that that's, it means your uterus is like stressed or, um, I don't remember what they called it exactly. Uter, uter, uterarian distress. That's what it is. My uterus was in distress. <clears throat> and so they kept having to lower the Pitocin. Um, but, uh, so that kind of sucked, but it was, it was pretty painful and it was, it sucked because during that time, I just wasn't getting a break from my contractions. Um, they did check me again somewhere midday that day, like 11 or 12, and I dilated to a three. So I, there was some progression. Um, it just wasn't as much as we wanted. When they checked me in the middle of the night when they had done the second dose of the cervix ripening agent, um, I just was still only a one. I hadn't dilated at all. So this at this point, the Pitocin had helped me dilate some. <coughs> um, they did... At one point, up it, I think, so they started off the Pitocin at like a two, um, and that's, they kept going between two and four and having to go back down to two, which I don't know what any of those numbers mean. I just know that's what the doctors, told, what the nurse and doctors told me. Who knows what it means? Um, later in the afternoon, they did up it to a four, and my contractions started getting a lot worse, um, and still they were back to back, but they started getting really bad where I was having trouble breathing through them. My whole body would tense up, which I know isn't good because your body can't do what it's supposed to do when you're all tensed. Um, and so I was stressed out about that because I kept trying to relax and I couldn't. Um, my mom was holding my hand and helping me by like telling me, you know, breathe through it. It's okay. We're, we're going to breathe through it. But it got to the point where every time I would feel one coming on, I would just start crying, which like I said, was back to back to back. Um... Around four o'clock in the afternoon, um, I had I asked them to check me again because I was feeling a lot more pressure down there, and I was just the contractions were a lot more painful, and I was feeling like I couldn't I could hardly take it anymore. And they checked me again, and I was still only at a three. I hadn't progressed any at all. <coughs> when they told me that, I burst into tears, and it I'm gonna cry. Um, it broke me. So for those of you who don't know, I was very determined to have a natural labor. And at this point I had been laboring since they had put the cervix 
ripening agent into my cervix at eight, probably, it's probably closer to nine o'clock the night before, I had been having contractions, real strong contractions. And um, I, they don't, I don't think they considered it active labor yet because it wasn't labor that was making me dilate. But for me, it felt like active labor. Like it was, it hurt. Um, so I'd been contracting since nine o'clock the night before. At this point, it's probably four or five o'clock. So it had been, I don't know, like 20 hours or so. However, I'm, I'm not going to do the math, but whatever the math is, it had been that long. Um, and I just, I burst into tears and I cried and I cried and I was like, I can't do this. I want the epidural. And I felt awful. I, my husband was like, if you need it, just get it. Like, don't feel bad about it. But I felt bad because I didn't want to do it. I wanted to do it natural. And it was a really hard decision for me to make. And the nurse was like, okay, I, I'm going to tell the anesthesiologist to come. Do you want me to go ahead and give you something in the meantime to try to take the edge off? And I was like, yes, please. So they gave me, it starts with an F, it's some painkiller. Um, I wish I could remember the name of it. I'm sorry. It starts with an F though. And they gave me that and she goes, it'll take about 10 seconds to kick in. And then right as, after she gave it to me, I got another contraction and I was just waiting and waiting for it to kick in and the contraction still hurt just as bad. And I was bawling my eyes out and I was like, when is this going to start working? And she was like, it's, you, you, she was like, it's not working yet. And I was like, no. And she was like, okay, well, for, it doesn't work for some people. You just may have, it may not work for you. And I was like, can you do me something else? And she was like, no, the anesthesiologist will be here soon. And I was crying and bawling because we had learned in our labor and delivery course, um, as well as I had read online to that, to get an epidural, once you ask for it, it can take a long time because you have to wait for the anesthesiologist. And a lot of times they're busy. They have other patients. And it's all that. Luckily, I was delivering in a very small hospital. I was the only, at this point, the only laboring person on the on, in the hospital. There was one other person who'd had a baby earlier that day, but there were we were the only two patients in labor and delivery. Um, and it was it was a small hospital. It's a rural hospital. They had built they had just built this one a couple of years a few years ago, probably five years ago or so. So it's still pretty tiny. So luckily, my anesthesiologist was there within ten minutes, which was amazing. Um, and he talked me through everything. Um, I do have scoliosis. I've had it since I was a kid. It's never been an issue. So I didn't really think of anything of it until he was about to, until he came in the room and I was like, Oh, by the way, I have scoliosis. Don't know if that matters. And he was like, thanks for telling me that actually does matter. And I was like, okay. So he had me, they had me do the whole thing where you bend over. So your back curves, um, and hold on to your husband. And I held on to my, uh, my husband and then he was trying to find, he was trying to feel my spine to see where it curved. He didn't really, he couldn't really tell. He's like, does it curve to the left or to the right? And I was like, I don't, I don't remember. I was like 11 when they diagnosed me and it's never been an issue. So I've never had to deal with it again. So he did, um, he did finally kind of figure it out and he stuck me and he asked me if I could feel it more on one side or the other. I couldn't really tell, but I thought I felt it more on one side. Anyways, all in all, he ended up having to stick me three times before he got it in. Once they got it in, they told me it could take about 10 minutes or so for it to kick in and be in, be effective. Um, and so they were like, they were like, we're just going to wait and kind of see. And within the, and then, um, next thing I know, the nurse is like, is saying, oh, you're having a contraction. Are you feeling anything? And I'm like, no, this is awesome. And I was so thankful because for once I was having a break and it felt so good. <laughs> and I was so thankful right immediately that I had done it. Um, in the future, I still don't know if I will get it. I might try to do it naturally because a, if it hadn't lasted so long and B, if I hadn't had the back labor, I think I could have done natural. I don't know for sure though, cause I never made it made it that far naturally. So maybe not, but they do say your contractions are a lot stronger when you have to be given Pitocin. So I don't know. Anyway, so they gave me the epidural and at that point I decided to take a nap because I'd been awake. I hadn't, I didn't sleep at all the night before I'd been awake for a long time and I was exhausted. So I took a nap and later that night, um, the nurses started coming in and then my doctor came in and they were just kind of watching the, the heart monitor for the baby which kind of worried me. And then they started telling me that when I was having contractions, his heart rate was dropping a little. So that worried me. Um, at that point, they decided to go ahead and put a device inside my, uh, my uterus to monitor my contractions. And then they did that for a little while because they wanted to see how strong my contractions were. 
Um, and then they also put a monitor on the baby's head to monitor his heart rate. So they did all that. It was probably around eight o'clock at night when that happened on March 6th, um, which was a Tuesday. And, um, and then my doctor's nurse, my doctor's a nurse were in and out of my room quite often after that monitoring the baby's heart rate. Um, basically whenever I'd have a contraction, his heart rate would drop. And at first it would pop right back up right as soon as the contraction was over. So my doctor wasn't too worried about it. And then as the night went on, it started when it would drop, just taking longer to pop back up. So she started getting more and more worried. Um, they checked me again, probably around 10 or so. And I was dilated to about five and a half, um, maybe a six, <clears throat> which, so I was progressing. My doctor was like, okay, we're just going to keep monitoring it. And we're going to, we're going to see. Oh, I do want to mention that once I got the epidural, they cranked the Pitocin way up. They put it on like 12 or something. I think they said 12 or 14 was the number that they ended up putting it on. Anyways, and I'm, I'm not a nurse. I know nothing about what these numbers mean. Sorry if they're wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's what they said. Um, so at about 1130, like I said, my, my doctor and nurses were in and out a lot between the time his heart rate started dropping and here. And then 1130-ish, my doctor came in. And she, a few of the times before when she had come in, she started talking about the possibility of needing to do a C-section if his heart rate wasn't steady enough. Um, and then at 1130-ish, she came in and she goes, Shauna, we need to do a C-section. We need to get him out. It's just not safe for him anymore. And I had had time at this point to kind of come to terms with that. Um... I had already known that being induced was a like a higher likeliness that I was going to have to have a C-section anyways. So even before I'd come to the hospital, I'd kind of started to like prep myself that that might be a possibility. So I was like, okay, let's get him out. And she goes, it's not an emergency situation at the moment. It's just urgent. We're going to take our time. We're going to prep you. We're going to get you ready and we're going to take you back. And I was like, okay. And we had learned in our labor and delivery course that when it's non-emergent, um, they'll usually take about an hour of time to prep you and get you ready. Sorry, Charlie is on the baby monitor and he's starting to stir. Um, they'll prep you and get you ready before they take you back. Um, so I was prepared. I was like, okay, so we're going to have a baby. His birthday is going to be March 7th because at this point it's already 1130 at night on March 6th. <coughs> and I'm thinking it'll take a little bit of time to prep me and get me back. Next thing I know, within minutes, I'm being wheeled into the operating room. I don't know if something had changed in that time or if she just didn't want me to see how concerned she was when she'd come in and told me. Um, I'm thinking something may have changed within a couple minutes because they all of a sudden people were running in the room getting me. And I mean, they didn't do it. They literally came in the room, grabbed me and wheeled me out while, as they were throwing like the scrub things at my husband. Like it was insane. And then we get into the... Um, operating room I guess and there's just people all around me hooking me up all at once doing things all at once they had two anesthesiologists in there like putting stuff in me um it was crazy I do want to point out as soon as they laid me down flat on my back I started throwing up immediately I started throwing up it was awful because you're stuck on your back trying to throw up and so it's just like going down the side of my face because I can't sit up to like throw up um it was awful my doctor's yelling at the anesthesiologist to give me stuff. They're trying to pump me full of anti-nausea medicines. They ended up giving me four different types of anti-nausea medicine, none of which helped. So I ended up throwing up the entire C-section, just so y'all know. I'm not going to bring that up again, but I literally threw up the entire C-section. They also, something that they gave me, gave me, um, made me shake really bad. So I'm also shaking uncontrollably throughout the entire C-section as well. So I'm miserable. Um, so they take me back to the operating room, get me all wired up. They bring my husband in and then she's cutting into me within minutes. Um, they ended up, I mean, they ended up cutting him out. He was born at 1151. So it was, it was a pretty quick process that they got us back there and got him out. So he was born at 1151 on March 6th. Once they got him out, um, he wasn't screaming. Um, apparently his cord had been wrapped around not only his neck, but his entire body. And that's what was making his heart rate drop every time I had a contraction. We don't know if this happened when my doctor broke my water, which I forgot to mention. She did that probably around five o'clock or so. It was before his heart rate dropped, but after I got the epidural. So actually it wasn't, it was right before I got the epidural. So it was probably earlier. It was probably like two-ish in the afternoon. 
So they broke my water. Um, we don't know because when you when the doctor breaks your water, that can make the cord wrap around their neck when it like falls. Um, or we they think it might have happened previously, and that's why he hadn't been growing as much. They're not sure a hundred percent. But his cord was wrapped around him. So they immediately take him up to the warmer and the pediatrician is trying to like suction stuff out of him and trying to like rub they're rubbing him and trying to get him to respond. Um because he was, they said he was in shock. His eyes were wide open, and it was just like he was in shock. Um, and it felt like forever that it took for him to start crying. But eventually, and I'm you know sitting there crying and throwing up and asking my husband why he's not crying and telling him to go check on him. And and then eventually he cries, and it was great. Luckily, they have the warmer in my eyesight, so I could see everything. After they get him all situated and he's good and he's breathing, they ask him. I had asked when my doctor had told me she needed to do a C-section, I had asked if we could still do skin to skin. And she said, yes, of course, as long as everything's okay. So as soon as they get him okay, they ask if I want to, they're like, okay, do you want to do the skin to skin now? Which I did, but I was throwing up uncontrollably, shaking nonstop. And I was just like, I can't, like, I, I, I can't, I don't, I don't want to hold him because I'm afraid I'll drop him. I don't like, I, I just, I feel awful. So they gave him to my husband instead. And my husband was able to hold him. At that point, they took my husband and the baby out, um, and they told him that it was only going to be about 10 minutes, and then I'd be back. Um, but because I kept throwing up, my doctor kept having to stop sewing my stomach up. Um, because every time I'd throw up, of course, your abs and everything contract, and your stomach muscles move. And so she kept having to stop sewing me every time I'd throw up. So that was really hard, especially because I guess a lot of women actually get sick when they're in there, like, moving around. Um, and so it just was making it worse. Apparently it ended up taking about 30 to 40 minutes before they finally finished and wheeled me back into the room. Um, they tried to do, they asked me again if I wanted to do skin to skin, but I was still shaking uncontrollably and still really nauseous. Um, and so I didn't do it right away cause I didn't, I didn't want to hold him again. I was afraid I'd drop him because I couldn't stop shaking. They did give me more Zofran at that point, um, which is an anti-nausea medicine. And I did finally get, stop throwing up. <coughs> and then the shakes took about 30 to 45 minutes after I got back to the room before they stopped. Once they had calmed down a little bit, I did go ahead and do skin to skin with him, um, which was awesome and amazing. And he's gorgeous. I'll try to insert some photos at the end here of right when he was first born and on the warmer. And then also once we started doing skin to skin. Um, <clears throat> but it was a very long process. And it was scary and a little bit traumatic, but he's here and he's happy and healthy. He ended up weighing seven pounds and three ounces and was 19 inches long and 19 and a half inches long and born at 11 51 PM on March 6, 2018. And his name is Charles Raymond and I'm in love. He's adorable and precious. And even though nothing went as planned, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, so that is my labor and delivery story. If you guys have any questions, feel free to leave comments down below and I'll try my best to answer them. I am sure I left things out or forgot things. I wish I would have kept notes that day while I was in labor um, of when everything happened. I'm just trying my best to remember what had happened. But again, I was exhausted, no sleep. And then once I, and then the whole C-section everything is kind of a whirlwind. It went really quick and was really scary. So anyways, I'm going to end this here because this video is already extremely long and I will see you guys next time. If you aren't, please make sure you subscribe to my channel. If you want to see more videos about baby Charlie and pregnancy, or I guess not pregnancy anymore since I'm not pregnant, but mom life and things like that. And if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up for me. Bye guys.